There's no denying that music is a massive element of culture. The first recovered piece of recorded music stems back to 800 BCE. And yeah, it's clear that it's a really big part of our human history. So today we wanted to talk about music being used as a cultural weapon. weapon. I feel like music is really, it gets into your head. Like there's a whole phenomenon of earworms and things yeah. that just repeat and repeat in your head. And there's really specific songs you can think of that are just so catchy that you don't even want someone to play it or talk yeah, about it exactly. in front of you. But there's a mm. whole science and study into it. Like are some people more susceptible to earworms? It's a whole form of like getting things into people's heads. Yeah. Yeah, so there's actually a study done by the American Psychological Association that found there's some characteristics that make songs more likely to become earworms. They're usually fast paced with an easy to remember melody and they have unusual intervals or repetitions that make them stand out from other songs. They tend to be played on the radio more than other songs Mm. and are usually featured in the top of the charts. The most frequently named earworms during the study were Bad Romance by Lady Gaga, <laughs> Can't Get You Out of My Head by Kylie Minogue, Don't Stop so Believing by me. Journey, Ooh. and Somebody That I Used to Know by Gautier. So yeah, hopefully mm. by me saying that, some of those just got stuck in your head. We're doing some <laughs> psychological <laughs> warfare on you. And on the topic of psychological Psycho- warfare... I had a couple of, of examples, like, um, like North Korea and South Korea, how... Um, Oh, and also there's one notable one, which is when they were trying to get um the Pan Panama dictator, um Manuel Norega, out um and they were trying to kind of like imprison him and make him surrender. They basically played a bunch of like rock and like heavy metal music to just torture him because he was just hiding in the Vatican's um embassy in Panama, and so the President Bush, um, they were playing a bunch of like rock songs like um, Guns N' Roses. Uh, what else were they playing? They were playing Black Sabbath, Paranoid. <gasps> they were also playing Give It Up. I was looking through the list last night and I was like, damn, I wish I was there. Yeah, I wouldn't get mad at that, but it's interesting that they used that to get him to come out. Yeah, exactly. Was it because he didn't like it or he did? No, I think they were just tormenting him for like days on days, like non-stop. Like they had speakers all around the embassy kind of place and they were just blasting it at him. That's so easy. Yeah, and that's just, that's not the only example um, in North Korea and South Korea. South Korea would play um, K-pop of and kind of like propaganda and telling them that oh you're being lied to and stuff like that and one of the really funny k-pop songs they were playing was bang 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 by big bang it's so funny and yeah and north korea responded by playing their own propaganda so you can see how (laughs) this yeah it's the battle of the bands exactly it's interesting too because there's songs that are quite like popular over here and stuff that Mm. we're reading about like it's not necessarily but it's Um, I think there's a certain element to the songs like what we were talking about with earworms that make them more tormenting or more catchy. Yeah, and the Slim Shady by Eminem. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I was reading as well that um, that some people in prison in Afghanistan and um, Iraq, they they basically were tormented with (laughs) some the Slim Shady by Eminem, like days on end, and they were also... (laughs) Playing Barney and Sesame Street, like, I love you, <laughs> you love me. It's so interesting to think about just how music is used in our common lives. And it makes mm-hmm. sense that it's used, like, for psychological warfare or as yeah. a cultural weapon. Because, um, I don't know, for me, I associate so many memories to music. And if you yeah. play a certain song, it just takes me back to that time. Exactly. Your brain makes really strong mm-hmm. associations it to does. music. And, um, yeah, I guess that makes it make sense to me. And also, Mm. even um, movies. This is, like, an example close to my heart because I'm a filmmaker and I love soundtracks and movies. Uh, If you play a scene without the music, it's so different. Like, the worst thing is when you're actually making a film and you're in the edit Mm. and you don't have music behind the scene. Like, 
you can't even envision it being a proper scene. Like, mm. it feels so awkward. A sad scene doesn't feel sad. A mm. suspenseful scene doesn't feel suspenseful until you add the music, at least to me. And, of course, there's some scenes that can be silent and work without the music, but literally directors and editors use, like, replacement music before they have their soundtrack sometimes mm. just because they need to be able to tell what the scene's going to be like because yeah. the music is what defines Essential. the mood yeah. and everything in the film yeah and um going back to what i was talking about about the prisoners being tormented with eminem <laughs> they were saying how people were literally banging their heads against the wall and they they were just so annoyed and it basically wears you out yeah like, when you have this repeated music just and that, going on in your head yeah i feel like that matches the image you have of an earworm too it's like a song burrows its way into yeah, your brain it gets and so it frustrating yeah yeah and even amnesty was talking there was an amnesty spokeswoman who was saying how oh this is psychological warfare and how this is just not ethical you know mm -hmm. and it's very interesting to think about the ethics of it as well yeah because when you talk about sleep deprivation and stuff, you basically end up having the same effect, you know? Mm -hmm. Of, like, exhaustion, frustration, and you just can't think straight because that music's just yeah. banging around in your head. And there's also, we did a video talking about Wind of Change. I don't know if that reaction is out yet. If it is, we'll link it. If not, it will link to this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Yeah, so it's, like, pretty common knowledge that rock music played a massive role in the um, downfall of the Soviet Union. And there's all sorts of conspiracy theories that, like, the CIA was implanting certain songs, writing certain songs. Oh. So, like, the, the conspiracy was that they helped write Wind of Change, and that became an anthem of, like, the Berlin Wall and all this mm, stuff happening, yeah. the downfall of the Soviet Union. And there were also, like... Of course, it's not only music being used. They were, like, distributing books and stuff like Dr. Zhivago and things that were basically... It was, like, soft power. It's yeah. using culture to change the whole political and yeah. cultural um, landscape of a place. Exactly. And then, like, even looking here, you can see the Beatles sparked the love of rock in Soviet youth and its popularity spread. There was a bunch of artists that played behind the Iron Curtain... Like Elton John, Queen, Rolling Stones, David Bowie, Springsteen, Billy Joel, and Ozzy Osbourne, which is interesting because oh, yeah. I feel like it might it would have bred rebellion and like yeah. it's yeah it's interesting that they actually let them play behind the I Iron know. Curtain. And I think the thing about music is that it's not just a single element; mm -hmm. it's it's music and words. And many a times, people just purely listen to it for its melody and forget about the lyrics behind it. And I feel like um, this is how it gets into people's heads, like how it changes culture because mm -hmm. you you just get, your head just gets subconsciously. Um, injected with these lyrics that are probably contrary to like what you believe in yeah even like i'm thinking of because we did rage against the machine we'll link that above and uh a lot of their in their self-titled album like bullet in the head it's talking about the way that propaganda is spread and the the power of the microphone the fistful of yeah. steel and all this stuff and how the power that music itself actually has in spreading and changing culture mm -hmm. uh and it's interesting thinking about Rage Against the Machine's case because there's this video circulating a while ago of these... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, I sent <laughs> it to so her and it was so funny. Um, it's basically a video of all these Republicans dancing in front of a sign that says Blue Lives Matter to killing in the name <laughs> by Rage Against the Machine, which it seems so ignorant <laughs> and hilarious given the message of the song. Mm. But then it's also interesting, like... Uh, the lyrics aren't they're so clear and like not blunt but at the same time they are open to interpretation. interpretation they're pointing it out and they're doing it in a way that seems to weirdly relate to a lot of people yeah. even if they're just listening to the song and like thinking oh this is a powerful song and it makes me feel like I want to mm. start a revolution mm. and what that revolution is about maybe they don't pay attention to the lyrics or maybe they just have a contrary interpretation yeah. of them and it's also a bit of the confirmation bias mm -hmm. where you just look at something you're like, oh, you just interpret it in a way you want to. 
mm -hmm. many a time. So I guess that's where it is. Music it's so it's really strong as a cultural weapon because on one hand the authorities may interpret it as like oh it's a national song it's an it's an anthem, um it's it's very patriotic but um to the citizens they might interpret it in a different way and be like yeah i'm gonna overthrow this government you know yeah it can definitely take on a different meaning like uh god save the queen i'm thinking of like oh, the yeah. sex pistols and yeah. how they took god save the queen and they turn it into this like really punk rebellious song mm. that's like against the monarchy and then it gets banned in the uk and they won't even play it on the radio yeah and it's like it's obviously governments also recognize the power of music mm. in the fact that they ban them and on that topic it's quite interesting because we Obviously, we're a music reaction channel, and a lot of the time we have to <laughs> test copyright on yes. our um, songs. And recently, we've been like uploading songs just as a precaution before we mm. react to them, and they keep getting blocked in North Korea, Iran, Syria, yeah, and, and Cuba. Cuba, which I find it interesting that it's those countries. Why are they blocking specific mm. music? And what's some examples like? Purple Rain by Prince, I think, was getting blocked. What yeah. else? Um, Basket Case by Green Day. This um, Charming Man by The Smiths. 2009 by Mac Miller. I, I don't even know why they are specifically blocked. I'm not sure why it's specific songs. Like, obviously, uh, normally that's because of copyright issues. So maybe other people own the rights to those in those countries. But it's weird because they're very specific countries. Like, yeah. North Korea. I didn't even think that <laughs> North Korea had YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, why would they block it in North Korea if they didn't have it? And like, yeah, I don't know. It just seems like interesting countries that they would block it in. But I mm. think obviously there's... You can see the common theme in those countries. Yeah, and there's obviously large censorship in a lot of places mm. anyway. So ob anyway, what I'm saying is that those governments mm. obviously recognize the power that music holds. Mm. And also it's not just those countries, it's Russia as well. And I was just recently reading up about Pussy Riot and how they're just this activist that also produced music in Russia. And basically they have been put into labor camps and everything for putting out music. Something There was one that was like praying. They, so they basically had this protest or rally at um, this chapel, I think. And they were just, and they were singing this song, and they were basically um, praying that the Virgin Mary would basically um, kick, um, put it out, or Ooh. something like that. And then um, there was also another one that said that put in, like, pissed his pants or something. <laughs> and so they basically put out music like that, and the number of times they've been put into labor camps and I love how everything. you say put in and put, put in. Like put in. <laughs> put in. <laughs> They've been put into labor camps. Uh -huh. Ooh. That was a put in, put joke. in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a horrible joke. But yeah, no, that's really interesting. And I think music is like a very clear symbol of rebellion too. As much mm. as it gets used by governments and political groups themselves, there's also the argument like, is listening to music a political act in itself? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, just like we were talking about this on separating art from the artist. Mm. Check that out. We're plugging so many videos <laughs> in this. But um, there's an argument of whether reading is always a political act. And we've kind of discussed this quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I think one of our commenters was like, oh, I wholeheartedly disagree. Reading is not always a political act. But it's like... If you want to say reading's always a political act, a lot of things we do is always a political act. I feel like it extends. So basically, if you're going to be saying that reading is a political act, I feel like you can justify this by saying that you are basically shaped by all your experiences around you. And I'm, I know that this is like a philosophical debate, <laughs> but um, whatever you read, whatever you intake through your senses, I feel like that's ultimately going to shape who you are, how you're going to think and how you approach the world. Yeah. So, 
No, it's okay. It's, it's not too philosophical. Because yeah. we could get a lot worse than that. <laughs> um, but you're right. Yeah, the things that you consume, that's like the whole argument behind you are what you eat. Mm. Like everything you put into your body, everything you put into your mind, it does have some kind of effect. And yeah, we feel like we have control over it. But if all you read for... Um, like five months straight is ro- trashy romance novels then like you're gonna be a hopeless romantic you think so <laughs> right um or maybe they're so trash that you just hate romance yeah. but yeah i think uh whether it's a political act is a bit of an aside from that because that's like if 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 you're arguing it with that basis then it means that everything you put into yourself is going to form something political mm. Um, politics At is the stakes. activities associated with the governance of a country or area, yeah, especially the debate between parties having power. Yeah. Activities aimed at improving someone's status or increasing power within an organization. So yeah, really, it's just the activities of power. Mm. Um, yes, in its main definition, where to- you talk about it more in terms of like organized states, countries, etc. But um, I think. The activities aimed at improving someone's status or increasing power 100% have a very clear link to music and reading yeah. and like all of these cultural tools that I used. Mm. And even when we were talking about the elements in music itself, like the bass pumps people up, you have the drums to basically like keep the rhythm up and then keep the rhythm and excitement and you've got the melody that gets stuck in your head. So all these different elements in the music itself, just it's what makes it so influential, I feel like. Yeah, and also I think it's clear that it's, um, it's music is culture and is defined by mm. culture too. That like so many groups identify themselves based on what music they listen to, and it becomes yeah. like it becomes division between people. It's like, oh, I won't be friends with you if you don't listen to rap. Like, I there's people like that. There's, mm. and it doesn't have to be like that. There's so many people who could not give two craps what kind of music you listen to, but there's a whole tribalism behind music too. And like, even if you try and think about it in a nice naturalistic fallacy biological old way like you can imagine tribes actually being bonded by music and the power yeah. of that even the language like, associated yeah, with it even singing like singing in groups is such an old thing to do yeah and like a very powerful a communal thing like it national anthems it can be really patriotic mm. but it can also unite people against something mm. and i feel like for me i never feel more empowered or like together than when I'm at a concert or I'm like singing songs that yeah. really mean a lot to me and or with you're thousands in, of other or people. you're in a school choir yeah. with a big group of people just like singing one song yeah there's something really powerful about that too so today by looking at the different elements in the music and the way that um, music has basically permeated our society um, we can see that music is inherently cultural and they have been used by individuals and um, groups of people over the ages to basically um, spark patriotism or, um, or rebellion, spark rebellion, enact change, power, mm-hmm. spread ideas. There's so many different uses of music, just mm-hmm. like any form of art. And I think it's really interesting the way we've described it today. Mm. So if you want to hear more from us, remember to like, subscribe, and and comment comment down down below. below. We'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Bye!